Welcome, gentlemen. Great to have you here tonight. We're going to get started because we have a lot to cover. So, uh, you know, fasten your seat belts. Um, I'm excited that you're here, excited that you have an interest in not only the Word of God, but in knowing how to better dive into it, whether for yourself or whether for teaching or some combination of the two. And so uh, I'm looking forward to our next sessions together tonight and the next time. And then for those of you who, uh, who want to take the, uh, the final part as well and have your teaching critiqued, we're, we're just excited to be a part of it. So let's get started with prayer and then we'll, uh, we'll begin. Pray with me. Our Father, it is our great joy to have your word. Lord, what a treasure you have given us in your word. Thank you that we don't have to look inside of our minds in some mystical way some subjective way to discern your voice, but rather you have given us your revelation in words and letters and sentences, paragraphs that our minds can digest, that we can see that, as Luther said, we have the external word. Father, we're so grateful for that treasure. Now give us help tonight and in the coming weeks as we consider how best to to study it and how to craft from that study a, a lesson that would be meaningful and clear, and, uh, Lord, how to improve in those skills and gifts. We thank you again for our time together tonight. Use it for good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it just me, or we got a little uh, echo going on here? Yeah, okay, you can bring it down a little bit. I think my voice covers fairly well here. All right. So I want you to start with me in 1 Timothy chapter 4 because I just want to set a context for what we're here to do and why this matters. The book of, bless you, the book of 1 Timothy is given according to chapter 3 to teach us how to do life in the church. Paul says, in case I'm delayed, I'm giving you this letter so that you will know what life in the, the church, the household of God should be like. In the process of that, he lays out this command to Timothy. He says in verse 13 of chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, Until I come, give attention to the reading of Scripture. Literally, it just says, to the reading, to exhortation, and teaching. This is um, an obvious verse. He's saying, look, I want you in the church, in the context of the church, I want you to give your full-hearted attention to the Word of God, to, notice what he says, to reading it, to teaching it, and to using it to exhort. Essentially, what he's saying is this, I want you to give attention to the, to the, te- to the reading of the Word of God, to the teaching of the Word of God, and to the applying of the Word of God, to teaching Reading, teaching, and application. Those are, the, those are the great priorities of a biblical teacher in the context of the church. But notice verse 15. He says, I want you to take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them. Literally, be in them. So that your progress will be evident to all. For those of us who have any interest in teaching God's word, we are never to be content with the level of our teaching. We ought to so be endeavoring that the people who hear us see our progress, that it is evident to them. That's my prayer and hope, that I am not where I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And thank God I'm not where I was when I began back in the mid-'80s, preaching at a little church in, um, in Gaffney, South Carolina. But our progress ought to be evident to all. How do you do that? Well, you have to apply yourself to these skills And that's really what you're here to do, to either begin or to take the the gifts and the experience you already have and to further refine it so that your progress becomes evident to all. So thank you for being here to that end. That's what we're about. Now, we're looking then at expository teaching and preaching. Now, until we, we get started here, we really have to understand the two most important words for a teacher or preacher of God's word. Two words, exegesis and exposition. They go together, exegesis and exposition, and they complement each other. To exegete is to draw out of a text all the truth that's in it. That is to go into a text 
and to pull out of it the truth that's there. That's exegesis. To exposit is to expose, to make visible, to make known. That is to show something for what it really is. It, it suggests throwing light on a subject. So exegesis is what we do when we come to study the Scripture, and exposition is what we do when we've completed our study, and we want to craft that, that exegesis into a lesson that's clear and meaningful and applicable to the people who hear us. So those two words go together. Exegesis, that's studying the text, and exposition, that's crafting a message or a lesson. All right? Those are the two words that are going to drive everything we do over the next two sessions that we have together. Let's start with a basic definition. This is from um, the Master's Seminary and MacArthur's book, Rediscovering Expository Preaching. Haddon Robinson, and this quote is ultimately from Bibsack. Haddon Robinson writes, here's, here's expositional preaching. The presentation of biblical truth derived from and transmitted through a historical, grammatical, spirit-guided study of a passage in its context which the Holy Spirit applies first to the life of the preacher and then through him to his congregation. That's a really thorough definition. Biblical truth derived from and transmitted through a historical, grammatical, spirit-guided study of a passage in its context. Here's another definition. This is Merrill Unger. No matter what the length of the portion explained may be, if it is handled in such a way that its real and essential meaning as it existed in the mind of the particular biblical writer and as it exists in the light of the overall context of Scripture is made plain and applied to the present-day needs of the hearers, it may properly be said to be expository preaching. Do you see that? Two, two basic ingredients. Taking the meaning of the text in its original context, but not leaving it there, applying it to your hearers in today's world. That constitutes exposition, expository preaching. Here are a couple of other definitions. Mark Dever writes, it's an, exp an expository sermon takes the main point of a passage of Scripture, makes it the main point of the sermon, and applies it to today. And then here's, here's my own. In exposition, the preacher reads the text, explains the text in its context, and then applies the text. That's what we just saw, right, in 1 Timothy 4. That's, that's our responsibility, those of us who would be teachers. So understand then, this is key. By the way, let me give you two basic caveats for tonight. One is, I'm going to go through a, a lot of material. There is no way you're going to be able to write down everything I have here. What I will do, however, for those of you who are interested, I can send you a PDF of the content of the slides. So um, that'll relieve your hand a great deal. Do take notes in terms of things that stand out to you, but don't feel like you have to get everything that I'm going to throw up here on the, on the overhead. The other, ex, the other caveat I would give is we are going to fly at a 30,000 foot level. The material that I'm going to cover with you this time and next time is a very condensed version of what I taught 27 hours on at the Master's Seminary. So know that we're, we're taking and reducing that to four hours. So you're getting the, the light version. Um, there's, there's benefit to that. There might be some disadvantages. If you're a really industrious person and you want to, that's out online somewhere. You can go find it and you can go through all 27 hours with me and you'll see it expanded. All right? So, to be an expository sermon then, you must begin with a biblical text. That's obvious, but some of you, many of you have been to churches where that's not understood Secondly, you must conduct a careful exegesis of that text in order to arrive at the author's original intention. You're going to hear me say that a lot tonight. Our job is to be a detective, to discover the original intention of the author. Okay, we, we, That's how we deal with the scripture. We don't read our meaning into it. We don't take our century into it. We try to discern the authorial intent. That's huge. Thirdly, you have to interpret the text literally and in its context, and we'll talk about what that means. You must prepare then and present a message that in a clear and orderly way explains the original intent of the passage and applies it to today. That is, 
That is what it means to be an expository sermon. All of those have to be there for it to be an expository sermon or lesson or whatever you're doing, okay? John Calvin puts it this way, since it is almost his only task to unfold the mind of the writer whom he has undertaken to expound, he misses his mark or at least strays outside his limits by the extent to which he leads his readers away from the meaning of his author. It is presumptuous and almost blasphemous to turn the meaning of Scripture around without due care as though it were some game that we were playing. And yet many scholars have done this. Many preachers have done this. Listen, we have to come to the Word of God with deadly seriousness. This is the Word of God. And if we presume to teach, we are the mouth of Christ to his people. That means we better be really serious about trying to discern what the Holy Spirit intended in that passage. It's not enough, men, to say what might be biblical somewhere. If we're teaching a passage, it needs to be what God says there. Okay? G. Campbell Morgan, and I'm not a big fan of G. Campbell Morgan's preaching, to be honest, but I love this definition um, because I think it's right. A biblical sermon contains three elements. One, truth, obviously, and that's the product of exegesis. That's the product of your study. Secondly, clarity. This is the product of order, explanation, argumentation, illustration, application, things that we're going to talk about as we go on. But truth, clarity, and thirdly, passion. Passion is demonstrated in your delivery and in your integrity. In other words, how is the truth going to grip somebody else if it hasn't gripped you? You know, if you stand up there and you seem completely unaffected and unmoved by the truth, then how is the truth going to grip somebody else? Because you're giving them the impression it doesn't really matter to you. It shouldn't really matter to them. I'm not talking about pretense now. I'm talking, but we'll talk about how to get to a point where the truth grips you so that when you stand up to teach it, it matters to you to get it across. But those are, those are absolutely true. And I'm reminded of those often. Truth, clarity, passion. That's a great way to summarize biblical preaching. Usually expository preaching is also systematic. That is, it is moving section by section through a book of the Bible. I say usually because there is such a thing as an expositional topical message. I know that seems contradictory. But what I mean is... You may be dealing with a topic and going to different texts, but in each text, you're dealing with that text with an expository method. You are are looking at that text in its context and interpreting it in that way. So, but usually it is also systematic. So here's an overview. I'm going to skip the introduction because we don't have time, but I would cover, if I were doing this, I would review the biblical foundations of Uh, the presuppositions of expository preaching, the primary arguments for consecutive exposition, and there are so many clear biblical, historical arguments for consecutive exposition. But I'm going to skip that because of time and why you're here, and we're going to go to these three elements. Here is an overview of what we're going to cover in the next two times we're together. Exegesis, that is studying the biblical text. That's tonight. Next time, we'll cover exposition, that is crafting an expository sermon, and we'll also include briefly delivery, preaching an expository sermon, just some key principles of delivery as well. Okay, so that's where we're going. Tonight, exegesis, studying the biblical text. Next week, or next time we meet, Lord willing, exposition, crafting an expository sermon, and briefly delivery. Okay, any questions so far? All right, well, let's keep moving then. Let's look at exegesis, studying the biblical text. The process of inductive Bible study, which is really what we're talking about when we use the word exegesis, it's inductive Bible study, um, includes several steps. Here I have put uh, John MacArthur, if you read one of his books on this, he would reduce it to these four steps, observation, interpretation, evaluation, and he includes in exegesis application. I actually include that in crafting your sermon, but 
that's fine. It's, that's not a big issue. But here's my, here are the five distinct steps that I've condensed our exegesis or our inductive Bible study to. First of all, there's preparation. And we'll talk about what I mean by that. Secondly, observation. Thirdly, meditation. I think it's key, and we'll briefly touch on that. Interpretation. And then finally, what I would call evaluation. This is where you turn to your commentaries, where you turn to the resources, um, specifically commentaries that tell you you know, the comment on the various passages you're teaching through. But all of those other steps are your own study, your own inductive Bible study. And that's what I want us to look at together. Preparation is how to prepare to study it. Observation is what it says. Meditation is how to think deeply about it so that you can understand it and do it. And interpretation is what it means. That's where you land not on what it says, but what it actually means. And then evaluation is where you look at what others say about it. Okay? So those are the, those are the steps. So I'm going to breeze through the first one because there's much that could be said, but in the interest of time, I just want to give you an outline. And you can read back through when I send you the slides. You can read back through it. I'm not going to touch on everything on every slide, okay? But here we go. In terms of preparation, here's what I mean. First of all, you have to prepare yourself. Obviously, you must be regenerate. John 8, 43, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot. You don't have the capacity to hear my word because you're not truly regenerate. Same thing with John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. He's not talking about hearing his voice audibly. He's talking about hearing his voice in the scripture. My sheep respond to my voice in the scripture. So you have to be regenerate. That's obvious, but I just have to mention it. You also must first confess your sin. James 1.21 says, once you deal with your sin, then you're able to receive the word. And so you have to be willing to come to your study with a, a clean heart and pure hands. And there, there are other texts as well. You have to come with an attitude of humility and dependence. You have to pray for illumination. You see... Bible study isn't like studying a, a, a college textbook. For you to really be gripped by the truth and be changed by it, the Holy Spirit has to be engaged in this process. And so you come praying like Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Or Psalm 119, 73, your hands made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. This is where you start. This is preparation. Or Psalm 119, 125, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Ephesians 118 says the same thing. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you can understand these great truths. So um, there are so many texts that make that point. If you're going to prepare yourself, you also have to commit to do the hard work that's involved. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent. Be diligent to present yourselves. The Greek word means to be especially conscientious in discharging an obligation. Especially conscientious. To be zealous. To make every effort. That's, that's from the leading Greek lexicon on the word be diligent. To present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. You have to work hard. Really study. Biblical study is hard work. You know, when I'm in my study, I lose track of where I am. I lose track of whether or not I've eaten, whether or not I've had anything to drink. I, you know, my wife has to, she teases that she wants to tie like a rope under the door around my ankle and yank it occasionally to make sure I'm still alive. It's hard work. It's brain sweat to try to deal with with the text. So here are some other ways to prepare yourself. Uh, I'm sorry, to prepare. Not only do you prepare yourself, but you prepare your surroundings. You need to think about this. Have a set time, your best time of day if possible. You want your clearest head when you're involved in study. So don't, you know, if you're a morning person, don't relegate this to 10 o'clock at night. Give it your best time if possible. I know, you know, some of you don't have that luxury. Do the best you can. I have a set place. 
quiet and free of distractions. You know, I, I, I know some people say, well, I study better at Starbucks. Well, maybe you do, but when I watch them studying at Starbucks, I can't tell you how many times their eyes come up and watch other things and other people. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, turn off and shut out all distractions. You know, turn off your beepers and bells and whistles on your phone. You don't need all those notifications while you're studying. Get rid of them so you can shut yourself in to the scripture. And then, of course, surround yourself with the necessary resources. That point deserves a lot more than I'm going to be able to give it tonight. But uh, maybe at a future time we can talk about that. And then choose a biblical book. For most of you as teachers, it's chosen for you. You know, if you're going to teach in our church, you're in the flow of something, so that's not as big as it would be for pastors who are having to make those choices. But there's a lot involved in that choice. I have several pages of notes that I'm going to skip on choosing a biblical book, but just know that that is a process to think through and to pray about. All right, so that's, that's an overview of preparation. Any questions there? I told you we were going to breeze through that really quickly. But I just want you to think about, before you come to the scripture, it's not like coming to you know, a manual for your car or to a textbook or to some book in your field. It requires the work of the Holy Spirit. It requires clean hands and a pure heart. It requires the humility to say, teach me. You know, the catechism says that, that um, you know, Jesus is a prophet. And the question is, why do I need a prophet? The children's catechism. You know the answer? Because I am ignorant and in need of a teacher. That's how we come to the scripture. That's how we come to the scripture. So, again, that was a, a real quick blow through. A lot of things that could be said there. And, and you, like I said, you can fill that out if you want to go online and listen. Observation, though. Here we get to the heart of exegesis. And we're going to take some time here. Because this is key. This is, if you really want to study the scripture, you've got to master this point, observation. Exegesis is using careful reading, thought, and analysis, along with all available tools, to systematically study the details of the text in order to arrive at its meaning. This is what we're talking about. It's careful reading, thought, and analysis using the tools available in a very systematic way to study the text in order to arrive at its original authorial intent. That's its meaning. What did the original author intend? The human author and ultimately the Holy Spirit. The goal of observation is to answer one question. What does this really say? That's what you're trying to get at. What does this really say? Jim Shaddix, in his book called The Passion Driven Sermon, writes this. He said, several years ago, one of the great Bible expositors of our day was teaching a pastor's training school on the value of using various Bible study tools for sermon preparation. During a discussion time, a young man posed an important question to him. Sir, he asked, don't you think it's important for me just to get alone with God and find out what the Holy Spirit is saying to me? The preacher's answer was shocking. Young man, he replied, I'm not interested in what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. In fact, you may be surprised to know that I'm not interested in what the Holy Spirit is saying to me. Then he explained, all I'm interested in is what the Holy Spirit is saying. And the Holy Spirit has been, been saying the same thing through a passage of scripture since the day he inspired it. And I'm going to use every available means that I have to find out what that is. That is what we're after. Here are, uh, so yeah, what does it really say? You know, of course, there, were, there was a dark time in the history of the church when this was lost, allegorical preaching really dominated, but that was recovered. Exposition was recovered with the Reformation. And here are a couple of quotes that I love from that period of time. Luther writes, the Holy Ghost is the all simplest writer that is in heaven or earth. Therefore, his words can have no other it can have no more than one simplest sense, which we call the scriptural or literal meaning. And this is maybe my favorite of all time. This is John Calvin. It is the first business of an interpreter to let the author say what he does say instead of attributing to him what we think he ought to say. So how do we approach this process of exegesis? 
We do so systematically. Luther said, first I shake the whole tree that the ripest fruit may fall. Then I climb the tree and shake each limb and then every branch and then each twig and then I look under each leaf. You know what he's saying? He's saying you start with the big and then you just keep drilling down and drilling down until you get to every detail in the text. What are you looking for in the observation stage? Or put another way, what are you trying to observe? Well, your your goal, as I said before, is to discern the author's original meaning. And it can only be discerned, listen to this guys, the author's original meaning can only be discerned by understanding his grammar using the normal principles of interpreting any literature and understanding his times. So in observation then, we are looking for two basic things. We're looking for context. First of all, historical context. What's the, what's the setting of the book in human history? And secondly, biblical context. The relationship of that paragraph or section to the surrounding passages, the rest of the book, and to the entire message of Scripture. So you're looking at historical and biblical context, and then you're looking at the content. And in that case, you're looking at two basic things, syntax. We'll talk about this, but it's just the relationship of phrases and clauses to one another. That's what gives meaning in language. And then words. That's it. That's what you're looking for as you study the Scripture. You're looking for historical and biblical context, and then you're looking, in terms of content, you're looking at words and the relationship of those words to each other because that's what yields meaning in any language. Spurgeon, quoting a writer that he had read, writes this, most read their Bibles like cows that stand in thick grass and trample under their feet the finest flowers and herbs. (laughs) In other words, don't ever hurry this step. Don't ever rush your way through it. So let's consider then the process of observation. This is what we're looking for, but how do we do this? How does this unfold? I'm going to give you, and this will be the, the kind of the, the meat of what we're covering tonight, I'm going to give you a series of steps. I think there are 12 of them in this observation process. You won't do all 12 of them every week, and I'll explain why that's true. But every week you study, you will do many of them if you're going to care about exegesis. So let's look at it. First of all, when you come to observation, you have to remember the big picture. And I'd mention this, this is just to keep in your mind. When you come to your passage, you know, you've been appointed to teach in children's Sunday school or youth or adult, a Bible study, whatever, you come to your passage, it has a large context. And what is that context? The entirety of the scripture. And you have to remember this you have to remember that essentially you're talking about the the theme of the Bible. Don't ever forget wherever you are, man, whatever you're teaching, it fits into the theme of the Bible. And for me, this is how I've couched this theme through my ministry. God is redeeming a people by his son, for his son, to his own glory. That's the message of the Bible. What that means is, I don't care where you are in the Bible, it relates to that theme because that is the theme of the entire Bible. Secondly, you have to remember the purpose of the Testaments. If you're, te- if you're dealing with an Old Testament passage, if you're dealing with a New Testament passage. In the Old Testament, the message is, he's coming. And, oh, by the way, here's why he desperately needs to come. You come to the New Testament, and in the Gospels, it's, he came. And in Acts and the epistles, it's, and this is what his coming meant. And then Revelation, he's coming again. So as you look at your text, don't ever lose that large perspective of how it fits in the overarching theme of Scripture and in the individual purpose of the Testaments. So this isn't something you need to do every week. It's something you need to be aware of every week as you come to the to the the scripture that you're studying or preparing. So remember the big picture. Number two, research the book's general introduction. Now, I'm assuming that you're teaching a book, okay? I'm just going to assume that, and and you're beginning to get your arms around this book. So stay with me. If you're jumping in the middle of a book, if that's your assignment, this is still a good thing to do, okay? It's important for you to understand what the book's doing, Uh, This is, by the way, something you should do before you read any book. 
at all. I mean, like any book. So, what do you do to, to research the book's general introduction? Number one, for an overview, by general introduction, I mean the big picture. Who wrote the book? To whom were they writing? When was it written? Why was it written? What's the point? That's general introduction. So you want to research the book's general introduction. For an overview of that, read the introductions to book, the book you're studying in a couple of, of brief forms. The MacArthur Study Bible has great introductions to all of the books of the Bible. Read that introduction. Or the ESV Study Bible, um, which I, it's, it's a good study Bible. I don't agree with it as much. It's got a broader base, and there are things that you'll find there I, I certainly wouldn't agree with. I don't think you'll agree with, but it's still a helpful resource. You're not going to find any book except the Bible you're going to agree with totally. So it's a, it's a good, it's a, it, both of those are helpful to get an overview. Plus, if you read a couple, they check each other. You know, it's like you find out, huh, they, you know, they're not agreed on this. I wonder why. And you're going to then get into that further as you read more. So the first step is to read the introductory notes in a couple of resources like this. A great summary. It identifies the key issues. If they're key issues, you're going to know what they are. Then you read the introductions, the general introductions in your commentaries. Um, if, you're, if you're teaching through Philippians, you ought to have at least a couple of good commentaries on Philippians. For example, in Romans, every, any book I'm teaching, basically, I have somewhere between 10 and 15 commentaries that I'm using and reading every week to digest what, what these other guys are saying. And I'll tell you when and how to do that. Not yet, but when you're starting to look at a book, read the general introductions in those books so you know what the issues are, what the, you know, how they're disagreeing, and so forth. And it helps you, you work through that. Number three, read through the book multiple times. Again, I'm assuming you're just starting. You're, you're thinking about doing this book. You've landed on doing this book. You research the book's general introduction, and then you read through the book multiple times. Somewhere between, the lowest I have ever seen is five times. MacArthur says 30 times. So somewhere between five and 30 times, you need to read through that book so you understand its content, so it's, you're beginning to absorb its content personally and really. If it's a larger book, you may want to break your, your repetitive reading up into sections. So if you're reading the Gospel of John, maybe you do chapters 1 through 7, and you do it however many times, and then you, you, know, you, you digest it in chunks um, as you work through it. So, but you want to be reading it, and you want to be reading it each time with a first-time attitude. Don't read it like, yeah, I read this before. Sometimes it helps to read it in different versions. Even if it's not your favorite version, it'll just prompt you to think about it and see it from a little different angle. So I do that. I, read, I love the NAS. I teach from the NAS. But I do a lot of reading in other versions, even, even paraphrases occasionally, just to rock my thinking and get me thinking differently. I remember that it's a paraphrase, that it's essentially a commentary, somebody's commentary on the text and not really a translation. But all of those things can be helpful as you try to digest the, the content of the book. Now, what are you trying to do in survey when you're reading over the book again and again and again? You're looking for a couple things. You're looking for the theme of the book. What's this book about? Every book is about one thing primarily, every book in the Bible. So what is the main thing this book is about? Sometimes that's in an explicit statement. Don't you love it when the authors do that? I just love it when Luke says, let me tell you why I'm writing. Or John says at the end of his gospel, I have written these things that. Thank you, John. Then there are the others that are a lot more difficult because you're looking at other things. What do you do? Well, you look for the repetition of certain phrases. For example, in Genesis, these are the generations of. Um, you look for exhortations because exhortations usually flow out of the purpose of the book. So you're, as you're reading it, your, your mind is thinking. As you're reading through and through and through, you're thinking, what is this book about? What's its theme? What's its main theme? What's the main point? You're also looking for the setting. You know, when was it written and what were the circumstances? You're looking for the author and the audience. Who wrote it and Why? Well, some of these things you may have already learned in the introductions, the general introductions, but this is the kind of thing you're looking for. Date, and you're looking for, 
you're beginning to digest it and saying, I need a basic outline of the book. Now, guys, here is, and forgive my whiteboard, but I don't think there's any better way to do this than the whiteboard. This is, if you, if you forget almost everything else I say tonight, don't forget this, because this is where most guys get off the boat, right here. So let, let me show you how you ought to be thinking about a book and its breakdown as you read it. Let's talk about Romans, since we're in there, okay? The book of Romans. So my top box here is the entire book. The book of Romans has a theme. Just one theme. So that's my first goal, is to discern the theme of the book of Romans. Well, it pretty much jumps out at you in the first chapter. In verse 2 and and through the beginning of that chapter and then down in verses 16 and 17, he introduces it. It's the gospel. The gospel of God. That's the theme of Romans. Romans. And everything in Romans is about that theme. Okay? Now, in the book of Romans, there are major sections. This is what we'll call this. Major, we'll call it major sections. So as you're reading, you're looking for those major sections. And guess what? Every single one of those major sections is going to be telling us something about what? The gospel of God. Somehow, every single section is going back there. So, let's take Romans. you got the first 17 verses, that's introduction. So, that doesn't kind of fit in our boxes. I could make another box for introduction, but for the sake of the main content of the book, I'm not going to include it. So, let's take the introduction away. Now we got one, our first main section of the book is the gospel explained. And I got too many boxes here, but you'll get the idea. Um, The gospel explained, and that's 118 to 320, I'm sorry, to uh, 4, the end of 4. What's the last verse of chapter 4? What did it tell me? 25. 25. Okay. So there you've got that section is talking about the gospel because Romans is about the gospel. And that section is saying, here's the gospel explained. Now, that major subsection is going to break down into minor subsections. So you have... You have the Jew, the guilt of the Jew, I'm sorry, the guilt of the pagan first. Getting ahead of myself here. You got the pagan in chapter one. Then you got the Jew and the religious person in chapter two through the middle of chapter three. And then at the end of chapter three, about 310, I think it is, to uh, 319, 320, sorry, um, you have all mankind. So you got all mankind here. Um, My point, what I want you to see is every, and I'll take that, you can't really read that anyway, I'll take that away. But you you get the major point is every section does that. So let's come over here to, let's just skip over to the gospel defended in chapters 9 through 11, where we are, okay? Again, it's relating back to the theme. It's doing something. It's saying something about the gospel. It's, it's taking the argument farther. And then every major section within that larger section, or minor section, we could call them, every minor section within that larger major section is somehow relating back to the defense of the gospel. So he's defending the gospel with election, He's defending the gospel with human responsibility. And then he's defending the gospel with God's faithfulness to his his Israel, to his people in chapter 11. Okay? Then when you look at election, there are sections within that minor section. Now we're breaking down to paragraphs within that minor section. Guess what every paragraph in that minor section does? Somehow explains election. Do you see, you see what I'm describing here? So as you're reading the book, you're looking for this tree. 
you're looking initially for what is the theme and where are the major divisions of that book? Where are the, the major sections as they break down? And then when you get to studying and you get to your responsibility to teach, you're taking that major section, you're saying where are the minor sections? And then where are the paragraphs? And how are they relating to, to the rest of that book? But always, it comes back here. If, if it's down here somewhere, if it's in that book, guess what? It's coming right back there because it's about the gospel of God somehow. If you keep this in mind when you're dealing with a book, it will seriously help you. This is always, always, always the same. I don't care if it's an epistle. The only exception would be Proverbs, and it's not a total exception because there are major sections in Proverbs, but they're also, uh, it's a little harder to trace because of the nature of the Proverbs. But everything else is going to follow this pattern right here. I don't care what, what kind of literature, essentially it's coming back here. Okay? Questions? If you'll, if you'll get that in your mind, if you'll lock down that, that it's always like this, then when you come to study a section, you're, you're assigned, let's say you're, you're assigned this section. Well, all you're doing is going backwards. Okay, what's the theme of the book? What section does this fall in? And how is that being developed? And now I know how my paragraph fits. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. He's saying, do I, do I identify this structure totally myself or do I follow some of what introductions have revealed to me or other resources? It really is a combination. Sometimes it's clear to me as I've read through it over and over again, it becomes, some books just break down that way. Other times I'm a little foggy about, okay, does, is this the section or is this the section? And then I'm going to look at some of my resources and I'm going to have them argue with each other. I'm going to see what they do, and I'm going to see why they do it, and then I'm going to come to a conclusion. But So it, it is in concert, but I never just go to a resource and let them tell me this. This is inductive Bible study. I'm trying to get there first myself, and then if I get stuck, they're helping me, you know, kind of work through this. Okay? All right. Well, let's move on. So that's what you're doing as you read through the book multiple times. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this. And, uh, you don't need to be reviewing Romans. You've heard enough of it. All right. So remember the big picture. That's just something that's in the back of your mind. Research the book's general introduction. Know what the book's about. Read through the book multiple times. Now, guys, that is something you do up front when you're starting to study a book. You're not going to do that every week. What I'm about to start with, you'll do every week. When you sit down to study, this is what will happen. I do... I do all that I just showed you there. I do that before I ever start teaching the book. Then when I come every week to study, what I'm about to show you is, is what I do. Okay, this is the path of my life. Every Wednesday and every Friday, or almost every Friday, but certainly every Wednesday, this is the path my life takes, okay? Number four, identify the paragraphs, if it's in prose, or the stanzas in poetry, um, you know, writing materials in the ancient world were costly. Uh, however, the books of the Hebrew scriptures were early divided into sections and paragraphs. Um, manuscripts of the New Testament were not broken down by chapter or paragraph or verse. And sometimes, like with what's called the unseals, they weren't even broken down by word. Literally, the words are pasted together. I mean, where you don't, there's no break, there's no space in order to save money because of the, writing, the cost of writing materials. Verse divisions were only added to our English Bibles with the Geneva Bible, actually of, of uh, 1599, a later edition of the Geneva Bible. So understand this, that we're looking not, when we look at verse divisions, those are not inspired. Even when we look at chapter divisions, those have been inserted at some point in the history of the scripture in order to help us find our way around. So you're then now approaching the scripture saying, is this a helpful division? 
because sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. So you want to identify the paragraphs in prose or the stanzas in poetry. Um, What tools do you use to do that? How do you identify paragraphs or stanzas? Well, if you know the, the ancient languages, you can look at, you know, Greek testaments often show the decisions of the scholars as to where they think the breaks are. Uh, But for most of you, you're going to use your English translations. You're going to use your English translations to do that. And how do you do that? Well, in prose, um, usually the paragraphs are arranged either by paragraph or by bolded number. In other words, your your Bible arranges the text into a paragraph. And the verse numbers are kind of hidden in in the paragraph. How many of you have a Bible like that in front of you where the the verse numbers are hidden in the paragraph? Yeah. In other cases, the the text is all to the left-hand margin and the verse numbers are in the left-hand margin. That's the way mine is. It's a great preaching Bible. If you're a teacher, by the way, get you one where the the verse is in the left-hand margin. You can find it so much quicker. (coughs) But in, in the case of paragraphs, obviously it's there in front of you, right? It's arranged already in paragraph form. In the case of verse numbers in the left-hand margin, how do you tell what the translators think? The number is bolded. Look in your Bible. If you have a a normal New American Standard, you'll see that there are some of the numbers are bolded if it's to the left-hand margin. That tells you that that's where the translators think the paragraph breaks are. So that's a helpful resource. Not inspired, but it's helpful. It tells you that's what some informed scholars thought about the paragraph breaks. All right. Um, in In the case of poetry, depending on the kind of version you have, either there's an extra return. In other words, there's extra white space in the poetry you're reading between the stanzas. Or, again, the verse number will be bolded. But somehow the translators are letting you know this is where we think the stanza breaks are. So you look for those. Now again, those aren't inspired, but they're helpful because it tells you where a group of informed Bible scholars thought the breaks were. Using these basic tools then, oh, I should give you a couple more real quick. Commentaries can help you too. If you get lost, you know, look and see where they put, you know, they're they're dealing with the text in this block. They say this is a paragraph. Again, they're not inspired either, but it's just another informed person helping you think this thing through. Um, You can also use your own survey as you work your way through. So using these basic tools, you'll have a pretty good idea where the paragraph breaks in prose occur and where the the section or strophe breaks in poetry occur. Why is that important? Why 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 does this matter? Because the principal feature of a paragraph or section is a unifying theme. So it makes sense then that you are looking for those sections because that has a unifying theme and that's the normal teaching or preaching unit. That paragraph or section of poetry is developing one idea. So it's the most natural way to organize your study and your your sermons even if, as in my case, it will take you several sermons to get through that paragraph. It still is the natural break. It's the natural unifying passage. Most expository preaching is centered around paragraphs. Not not always, and we'll talk about that in a moment, um, but usually. So, just to to mention that, what's the footprint of an expository sermon? Well, it can be an entire book in one sermon. I've done that. You've heard that. Dever, uh, Dever did, uh, you know, all 66 books of the Bible in a, in a single sermon. So you can do a, an, ex, an exposition of a passage uh, or of a book, an entire book in a single sermon. You can do a section of a, a major section and show how it sweeps through. You can do a chapter. You can do a, a paragraph, and this is the most common focus of expository preaching because the principal feature of a paragraph is a unifying theme. And that's why when you're, if you have control of what you're teaching, then you want to teach paragraphs. You may cover a couple different paragraphs in a message if you, if you choose, but you're still focusing your study on paragraphs because 
they're tied together by a unifying theme. Occasionally, a, a sermon, an expository sermon, can be a sentence or verse. Um, you've seen me do that often, even a phrase. And when I was teaching Romans 1 1, you know, an apostle, um, an apostle of God, that's, that was a sermon because of the importance of it. Uh, can be words or words. And when I did Romans 1 1, it had been a long time since I had covered the life of Paul, so I took the word Paul and developed his whole life for you. That's not technically an expository sermon, but it is related to it because I'm working my through, way through a text and explaining it to you. Um, one of my favorite sermons was Lloyd Jones' sermon on Ephesians 2 5 on the two words, but God. But God. So. It can even be on a topic, either one key passage or more often several carefully exegeted and explained passages. But primarily, here's what I want you to see, the preaching unit, the teaching unit, if you have any control over it, if you're not just assigned a paragraph, I'm sorry, a a chapter or two or three chapters, ordinarily it will be a paragraph in prose or a stanza in poetry. So you want to mark out those paragraphs or sections. Then you want to analyze the syntax. Now, guys, some of you are about to go white as ghosts here because this involves the study of grammar. I know when I say the word grammar, you get cold chills. Brings back, you know, nightmares of your days in high school or college. But, guys, grammar is not as foreign to you as you think. You analyze grammar every time you see a road sign. For example, you come up on a sign as you're driving home and it says, slow children ahead. You do grammar because you could come to a different conclusion than the meaning of the sign, right? But your mind does grammar and digests the meaning and the relationship of those words. Or, you know, like the t-shirt that says, you know, it has on it, let's eat grandma and then let's eat comma grandma and the bottom line says commas saves commas save lives you see what you see what it's doing let's eat grandma and let's eat grandma those are two different things and the comma is the only thing that distinguishes it and so you do analyze grammar you analyze grammar every time you read an article online every time you read a newspaper a magazine a book you an email you're analyzing grammar So, you use grammar certainly every time you read the Bible. Grammar, listen carefully, is nothing more than the rules by which language communicates meaning. That's all grammar is. The rules by which language communicates meaning. Why is grammar important? Because, let's not go there yet. Because as Luther said, first I shake the whole tree, the ripest fruit may fall, then I climb the tree and shake each limb, and then each branch, and then each twig, and then I look under each leaf. So far, guys, we've looked at the whole tree, the passage. Now we need to look at each branch and twig. That is, we need to look at how the phrases and clauses connect to each other. Syntax, listen carefully, is simply the relationship of clauses and phrases and how they're connected to each other. The way that words are put together to form phrases and clauses and sentences helps us discover the author's intended meaning. So, stay with me. I promise you this will be worth it. Okay, I promise you. So stick with me. Before we consider the best tool for analyzing grammar, let me give you a very brief English grammar lesson. It'll be crucial, but it's very simple. You'll you'll get it, okay? So stay with me. I used to teach English on the college level, and I had some students that struggled. I can get you there. Stay with me. Let's first of all look at clauses. What is a clause? Very simply, it is a part of a sentence that contains a subject and a verb. There are two types of clauses. There are independent clauses. That is a clause that expresses a complete thought or stands alone, a complete sentence. Charlie ate supper. That's a sentence. It has a subject and a verb. It's independent. It can stand alone. Then you have dependent clauses. This is a clause that does not express a complete thought, cannot stand alone. It's not a complete sentence. While Charlie ate supper. If you walked up to somebody and said, while Charlie ate supper, they're looking at you like, 
and, because that's a dependent clause. It can't stand alone. When Charlie ate supper, as Charlie ate supper, those are all dependent clauses. They're not sentences. They can't stand alone, but they have a subject and a verb. Okay? See, that's easy. Independent, dependent. All right, let's talk about phrases. This is all, this is all you need to learn right here. These two things, phrases and clauses. So a phrase is a group of words in a sentence without a subject and a verb. Okay? Clause, subject and a verb. Independent or dependent. Phrase, no subject or verb. There are two types of phrases. This is the easy one, prepositional phrases. This is a group of words without a verb that is introduced by a preposition. Now, there are three prepositions you just need to learn. Of, with, and about. Okay? Learn those three and then remember this. A preposition is anything that a squirrel can be to a stump or an airplane can be to a cloud. Under, over, above, in, through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Anything a squirrel can be to a stump or an airplane can be to a cloud. That's a preposition. And then you just have to learn of, with, and about. Okay? See, that was simple. I, I told you guys, this is easy. And it's going to matter. I'm going to show you in a, minute, in a minute why it matters. This is what I do every week. This is what people who analyze the scripture do. So stay with me. Now, here's the hardest part with phrases. I'm just admitting to you, this is harder. Remember, a phrase is a group of words in a sentence without a subject and a verb. There are two types of phrases, as I said. One is prepositional. The other is what's called a verbal phrase. Now, this is a group of words without a main verb, but with a verbal form. First of all, you have what's called a participle. This is a verb form that functions like an adjective. It's usually the, the present participle is the verb plus ing. So here's an example. Hearing. There's the participle. Hearing the phone ring, I answered it. Okay? Past participle is the verb plus ed. Stunned by the blow, Mike gathered his senses. That's, those are participles. The second kind of of verbal phrase is a gerund. This is a verb form that functions like a noun. Anything that a noun can do, the gerund can do. It's always the verb plus ing. So waiting for a text message kept me glued to my cell phone. Okay, Waiting kept me glued to my cell phone. What's the subject of that sentence? The verb is what? Kept. Okay, The subject is waiting. So here you have an ing form functioning like a noun, functioning like the subject of the sentence. And then here's the last one. See, we're almost done. You're almost there. Infinitive. An infinitive is easy because it is to plus a verb, but it's used as a noun or an adjective. They cannot be made to listen. They cannot be made what? To listen. I need a book to read on holiday. All right? So there you go. There's your English lesson. Got it? It's easy. So you don't have to remember everything I just shared with you, okay? I just want you to get the big picture. You're looking for phrases and clauses. You're looking for sections of sentences. Phrases and clauses, phrases and clauses. That's what we're going to deal with. So here's the key. When you're looking at grammar... You want to break the text down into smaller units. Then you want to identify the main clause. What is the main independent clause in that sentence? The sentence, subject, and verb. Then you want to identify all the other phrases and clauses, and then you want to understand their relationship to each other. This is all you need to do to understand any passage of Scripture. We're going to, I'm going to break this down for you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you examples, so stay with me. Okay, but this is what you're doing. You're, you're taking a paragraph, you're breaking it down into smaller portions, phrases and clauses. You're identifying the main clause, the, the, what the sentence is really about. Then you're identifying all the supporting phrases and clauses, and then you're trying to understand how they all relate to each other. That's, this is exegesis. What's the best tool for analyzing syntax? I have come to learn through my life 
and I want you to consider adding this tool to your Bible study. Whether you teach or not, add this tool to your Bible study. It's called block diagramming. Now, this was primarily assigned to me when I was in seminary. And there's a book that impacted me hugely in this way. I'm not suggesting you read it unless you're really eager. But it's called Toward an Exegetical Theology by Walt Kaiser. And in that book, I learned this approach. And it revolutionized my approach to understanding the author's thought. Block diagramming has become so important to me that I never, ever approach a passage without doing it. Not one time. Because I think it's so helpful in discerning the author's flow of thought. It doesn't diagram each sentence. You know, some of you were taught sentence diagramming and hated it. Uh, some of you maybe loved it. I don't know what's wrong with you, but, but I never did. But this is different. This doesn't diagram the sentence. Instead, it diagrams the paragraph as a whole. And each phrase and clause, now you see why phrases and clauses were important for you to know. Each phrase and clause is kept in the natural order of the passage. So you're not, you're not if you're teaching a passage, you're not kind of monkeying with them and throwing them around different places. You're leaving it in the natural flow of the author's writing. Supporting phrases and clauses are indented under what they modify. And it arranges all the material in a passage so that the relationships of whole sentences, phrases, and clauses are visually apparent at a glance. Now, the quickest way to do this, by the way, is on your computer. If you have a Bible software program, just take the block of text you're studying, copy it into your word, your word processing program, and you can do this really easily. You just tab over and indent. Okay, that's how I do it. Uh, I do it in Greek, in, in Romans. You can do it in English. Do it well in English, so don't worry about that. Um, so let me show you a couple of other things then I'm going to give you some examples if you stay for the examples you'll get it okay stay with me you'll, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about but I need to give you a couple of other pieces first you're looking for grammatical keys these are little words or parts of words that wield a disproportionately large influence on the composition of a text for example Look at these words. Look at the meaning in the left-hand column, and then look at the words. They're little words. And, that's parallel or equal. Or or but, that's contrast. Cause, words like for, because, since, as. Reason, for, because, since, as, that. Result, you see them there. Purpose, means, by, from, through, out of, in. Time. You see, these little words are tipping you off to a lot that's going on in your sentence. They're telling you things like reason, result, contrast, time, place. Now, that's not a complete list, but that gives you an idea. I just want you to see the kinds of words you're looking for. And so here's what you need to do. And I'm going I'm to give you some examples, not in the Bible, just to make it really clear. So, first of all, when you're going through your little paragraph, remember, you found a paragraph, you marked off your paragraph, now you've copied it into your word program, your word processing program. You are going to identify all possible of those little grammatical or content markers of structure. So, let me give you a sentence. Bob came home from work to rest because he was tired. Now, look at that sentence. What are the markers? What are those little words that carry huge meaning in the sentence. From, that's a preposition. To, that's part of a, an infinitive, to rest, to plus the verb. Because, those are really important words that show the flow of the author's thought. So from, to, and because. So the first thing you do is you identify those markers, those little markers. Then, secondly, you separate the major markers from the minor markers. Here's a quote from uh, Ramish Richard. He says, Just as bodies have big bones and little bones to connect and separate various parts from others, so biblical texts and all good writing feature big bones and little bones. So you will use your interpretive judgments along with those of others to understand the major and minor divisions of your text. 
For example, in the, in the sentence I just gave you, Bob came home from work to rest because he was tired. What is the most important of those minor markers in that sentence? Because, right? It's more important than from and to because it connects two parts of the sentence back to those clauses. You have a, an independent clause, Bob came home from work to rest, and you have a dependent clause because he was tired. So here you have a more important word because it's connecting two parts of the sentence together. Two entirely different parts. So you separate the major from the minor. Then you understand the meaning or the force of the major markers. In our sentence again, Bob came home from work to rest because he was tired. What is because? It's telling you the reason. The reason he came home was because he was tired. From refers to place, from work. To shows purpose. He came home from work to rest. That was his purpose in coming home. You see how this translates immediately to understanding the scripture? As you do the same thing with scripture, the meaning becomes much, much clearer to you in given texts. And then you outline the text according to the relative importance. You do your block diagram. You outline the text according to the relative importance of those markers. Structuring a text helps you outline the text according to the emphasis of the author, and it seeks to capture that emphasis in an outline. So now let's look at the Bible. All right, let's take an easy one. Ezra 7.10. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. I just went through here and I marked the markers, those little words that carry a huge impact in the meaning of the sentence. For to, of, and, to, and, to, and, in. Okay, so I just marked them. That's the first thing I did. Now, notice the twofold repetition of the connecting word and, joining three phrases. This verse is going to naturally divide into three parts. And, and, shows there are three parts. The third and simply connects two words studied statutes and ordinances, the others mark major things. So, doing all of that and looking at it, here's what a block diagram would look like, okay? If you were doing, you, you mark your key words, and remember you're indenting, supporting phrases and clauses. So we start with the word for. The word for is simply connecting back to the previous verse. So it's kind of got its own line. And then here's our, here's our dependent, our independent clause. Ezra had set his heart. That's the main thrust of this sentence. Ezra had set his heart. Under that, I've indented the, the phrases that support it. To study the law. Why did I put to study the law under set? Because that's what it modifies, right? He had set his heart to what? To study the law. And then I put of the Lord under law because it's the law specifically of the Lord. And to practice it. Notice I put that under set again. Why? Because that's what he set his heart to do. He set his heart to study. He set his heart to practice. And then thirdly, he set his heart to teach. And then his statutes is what he set his heart to teach. And ordinances is parallel to statutes and then in Israel. So you see all I've done, I've got a picture right now of the flow of the author's thought. I can look at that and I understand what this text is about. Now, the next thing you do is you identify the meaning. For, this is the reason of the previous verse. The previous verse is the good hand of his God was upon him. For, and there's the reason, Ezra had set his heart. There's the main proposition of the sentence. To study the law, that was his goal. He set his heart with the goal to study. He set his heart with the goal to practice. And he set his heart with the goal to teach. And his statutes is just the content of the law. Ordinance is the content of the law in Israel to whom or where he's going to teach. You see, this, once you've done that, you're ready to teach. I mean, you're getting close to understanding what that passage is about. You understand the main thrust of the passage. You understand its relationship to its context. You understand how it's the author's developing his thought. Let's take another example. 
Let's take a New Testament example, Ephesians 5, 22 to 24. You guys will love this. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. Um, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Again, what do you do? You start by looking for those little markers that, that change the meaning and thrust of the sentence. So I went through here. To, as, for, of, as, of, of, but as, to, so, to, and in. Okay? So now all I've done is mark them. Then I come back and I diagram it. Again, I indent under, I indent the phrases and clauses that support the other phrases and clauses. So I have wives be subject. There's your, the main thrust of the sentence. That is um, the, the independent clause. And then it has to your husbands. Why did I put that there? Because that's to whom they're to subject themselves, right? Uh, as to the Lord, and then for the husband is the head. Now, I'm not going to go through every line here because we don't have time, but you can see that what I've tried to do in each case is indent the supporting phrase or clause under what it supports. And I'm beginning, when I just look at that, I begin to see the flow of the author's thought. I see what he's doing. And then you come back and you're identifying the meaning. So wives be subject. There's your main subject and verb. To their own husbands. To whom they're to be subject. By the way, guys, all women are not to be subject to all men. Get that out of your mind. That is male chauvinism. That's not biblical. Biblical is to their own husbands. Um, then as to the Lord, that's how they're to submit. You see that? How they're to subject themselves. As to the Lord. For the husband. There's that word for. For the husband is the head. There's the reason they're to submit. And then that's developed in the indentations that follow. Um, for the husband is the head of his, uh, the head of whom? Of his wife. And he's the head as Christ also is the head. There's comparison of the church he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject, there's comparison to Christ, to whom, so also wives ought to be to their husbands, to whom, in everything, to what extent. Now, once you have done this, guys, you understand what Paul's saying. You still got study to do, don't get me wrong, but this is huge. When I go into my study, whether it's for Sunday morning or Sunday night, this, I, this is the very first thing I do. I take my text and I do a block diagram. Why? Because immediately the meaning, the main point is beginning to jump out at me and how the different parts of that paragraph are related to the other parts. It's becoming clear in my mind immediately. I'm not inventing this stuff. I'm just trying to understand what Paul's saying or whoever's saying. Okay? So, uh, there are other examples we can look at but we don't have time that requires practice let me just tell you the first time you try block diagramming you're going to throw your pencil on the desk or you're going to close your computer and go i don't know i don't know if i can ever listen it's just like riding a bike you felt that way the first time you tried to ride a bike too but i promise you if you will stay faithful and work on this it will become a huge tool in your understanding of the scripture huge so you when you sit down to study in a given week, you've got your passage in front of you, you identify the paragraphs, prose, or, or sections in poetry. You analyze the syntax using block diagram. Number six, you identify a preliminary theme. By the way, you guys want to take a five-minute break and hit the restrooms and get something to drink? Sorry, I lost track of time. Do that. Let's come back at, uh, in five minutes, all right? Thank you, guys. All right, guys, let's pull it back together. I've still got, oh my goodness, a lot to cover. Uh, we may have to sort of squish a little bit with next time and we'll get there. This is key though. This is foundational because this is how you get to the meaning of the text. If you don't have this, then it doesn't matter how wonderful your crafted sermon is because you've missed the whole point. So this is really foundational, all right? So in our study, in our observation, we're looking at analyzing the paragraphs, then analyzing the syntax of those paragraphs. And then you want to identify a preliminary theme. The biblical text 
has only one unchangeable meaning determined by the intent of the author. A text or a passage may have many implications, may have many applications, but only one, what Kaiser calls, single truth intention. So how do you get there? Well, I hate to tell you this, but it's expressed, the meaning is expressed in your text by means of letters, words, and grammar. All right, that's just the reality. And so it's what is the basic message of the paragraph reduced to a single sentence. That's what you're after. That's what I mean by a preliminary theme. It's you are looking at what is the basic point of that paragraph or section of scripture reduced to a simple sentence. Now, as you're doing this, at this point I say preliminary because as you study, you may end up changing it all together. You may decide, oh boy, I missed the whole point of the passage initially. More often, you're going to be refining it as you go along. As you do more study, you're going to say, well, you know, I, I thought that was the theme, but I need to tweak that. It's not maybe exactly the theme. And, but you want at this stage to identify the theme. How do you do that? Well, sometimes it's directly stated. You know, I, I was started in 1 Timothy 4. The theme of that passage is pay attention, verse 16, to yourself and to your teaching. And that's developed in that paragraph. So sometimes the theme is stated as it is there in that text, just like it is in Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God. And then he develops that theme. So the theme is out there, clear, it's right in front of you. Other times, the theme of that paragraph is contained in the words or concepts that are repeated. For example, and I won't take you there, we don't have time, but if you look at at Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and look for the the concept of will or purpose, you will be shocked at how often it occurs in that text. Because it's explaining to us the eternal purpose and will of God in, in the carrying out of redemption. So you're looking for repeated words or concepts. You're also looking for context. You know, for example, um, in Ephesians 4, verse 25, you have, or, or the previous verses, you have sanctification, right? Be uh, put off, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, put on. And then starting in verse 25, you have that illustrated. You know, don't, don't speak falsehood to each other. There's the put off. But rather, every man speak the truth with his neighbor. There's put on. And then there's a reason given. There's a, an explanation of how to renew your thinking, how to renew your mind. And down through the rest of chapter 4. So sometimes you discern that from the context. So you analyze. When you sit down each week, you start by identifying the paragraphs or sections. You analyze the syntax with block diagramming. All of that, it, once you get used to it, it won't take that long for you to do that. Then you identify a preliminary theme. What, what do I think this paragraph is about? What did Paul intend for this paragraph to be about? You write it out in a sing, simple sentence. So early in my study on Wednesday morning, you know, m- tomorrow morning, I'll be in my study by 6 o'clock, maybe a little earlier, and I will, I will pull out my, my uh, computer and I will... I've already done this actually for the text we're studying tomorrow, but I'll pull out the, the section in Greek that I'm going to be teaching on and I'll make sure it's done in a block diagram. Then I'll get, get my little legal pad and I eventually go to computer, but initially I do some notes on legal pad and I'll, I'll write down exegetical theme and I'll write it down. I think this th- the, the point of this passage, this paragraph is, boom, and I write it out. And then I put down an exegetical outline based on my syntactical analysis, based on my block diagram. This isn't my preaching outline yet. This is just, here's how I think Paul's developing his thought. All right? Now, the next thing you do, and and this happens, I'm putting this here as number seven, but truthfully, this happens kind of throughout this whole whole process. As you're looking at your text, you're making observations, and you're asking questions of the text. My father-in-law taught theology for 50 years, and he gave his students a, a project for theology class. He gave them two verses, 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10. And then he said, I want you, for your assignment this week, to write out a list of 25 
facts or observations that can be legitimately drawn from those two verses. And they're looking at those two verses and thinking, 25, how in the world am I ever going to come up with 25 you know, observations from those two verses? But they did it. Next assignment, okay, you did well. I want you to go back and make 25 more. Same passage. Of course, there's screams of agony at this point. You know, that can't be done. It's impossible. But they went and did it. They came back, and yes, he said, all right, you need to go find 25 more. 25 more legitimate observations from that text. They added all of their distinct observations possible from those two verses, and he told me they tallied almost 175 different thoughts, observations that they agreed could be drawn from those two verses. So understand this. This is what you need to be doing as you're looking at your text. You need to be probing it, pushing it, punching it, asking questions of it, looking under it, making observations. So here's, for each verse, you're going to ask questions of the text as if you had no idea what the text teaches. Questions like who, what, where, when, why, how. You're going to you know, who? Who wrote it? Who said it? Who's the main character? Who is this? Who's in this account? To whom is it written? About whom is it written? You get the idea. I'm just trying to give you some, some ideas here. What? What are the major ideas here? What's the main theme? What are the main events? What are the important lessons? Where? Where did it happen? Where will it happen? Where was it said? Where's the author? Where, where are the people reading this, this book or this letter? When? When did this happen? When was it written? You have to have an incredibly inquisitive mind in the process of Bible study. Why? Why is this important? Why did the writer include that detail? Why is so much written about this event or teaching? Why should we do what's commanded? Is there any explanation of why? How? How can this be done? How should it be done? How is the truth illustrated? So ask questions and let the text answer those questions, or if the text doesn't answer it, write your question down and see if in your later study it's answered as you continue to study. Make personal observations about what seems to be going on in the text. What do I see in this passage? Look for the key words, key topics, key people, commands, repeated words, concepts, etc. So live in the text and force yourself to be inquisitive. Don't just take it. You know, here's the problem. Most people's approach to the Bible, they read it and go, oh yeah, I read that before. I think I know what that means. Boom, and move on. That'll kill your real zeal for Bible study. You gotta, you gotta be curious. You gotta drive yourself back into that text until and, and you really understand it and everything you can understand about it. So make observations and ask questions of the text. Number eight, look up all proper nouns. Just identify the people, places, and things in your paragraph because sometimes that can affect the meaning. I wish I had time to give you examples. I don't. Number nine, look up cross-references. Look up cross-references. And how do you do that? Well, here are the ways I would suggest. First of all, look up parallel passages or cross-references that use the same words in the original language. The best, one of the best tools for that is if you had a, have a New American Standard Bible, look up the cross-references. If you have, if you have hopefully you have uh, some sort of a computer software because it's a lot quicker. And you can see the, the NAS cross-references because that's going to take you to some great cross-references that help you see different facets of that truth. Um, also, if you're, if you're in the Gospels, if you're teaching or studying in the Gospels, an invaluable tool I have a copy at my office here at church. I have a copy at my office at home because I use it all the time if I'm in the Gospels. It's the Harmony of the Gospels, uh, Thomas and Gundry's the Harmony of the Gospels. Because what they do is they take, they take it in chronological order, everything that's in the Gospels in the life of Christ. And then if, if one incident in the life of Christ is dealt with by all four Gospels, they give you parallel, parallel columns showing you what each of the Gospels says about that story. So you can compare and contrast, you know, which is what's adding, what's taken away, you know, and make sure you have the full story. Really helpful. Also, you want to look for passages that contain the same or similar ideas and concepts. These are really helpful tools, guys. If, 
uh, number one would be the treasury of scripture knowledge. It's, in, it's out there, leave it online. You can, get, you can get it for free. It's in most Bible software programs. Someone once asked John MacArthur at a, at a uh, Q&A I was at. Actually, it's been asked several times. But they asked him, if you, were de- if you were stranded on a desert island and you could have one book other than the Bible, what would it be? He said, the treasury of scripture knowledge. Why? Because it connects you from your passage to every other place in the Bible where that idea is dealt with. Now, it sometimes is a little broader a field. Sometimes I don't think it's really dealing with the same idea, so you want to be careful, but it's, a, it's still an incredibly helpful resource. The MacArthur Topical Bible, which is just Tory's topical textbook updated. I was involved in that project. We added about 10% more topics to it and published it as the MacArthur Topical Bible. And then Zondervan's Dictionary of Biblical Themes by Manser, McGrath, Packer, and Wiseman is really helpful too. It does it both by passage and by topic. You can go both ways. Uh, All of those are very helpful in looking at cross-references. So, you study the key words. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, because this... This requires more time than I have, but let me just answer this question. Why should you study keywords? Because if words have been in a language for any period of time, they acquire a variety of senses. Let, let me show you. Take the word, take this sentence. The leaders of the company were cool with how the board ran its affairs. Now, if you understand that. When you hear that sentence, it's not like the best sentence in the world, but you understand what it means, right? I mean, you read that and you get the idea. But let me give you some, show you how words get a variety of senses. The word cool means temperature, relaxed, half-hearted, distant, uninterested, and unfriendly. Bored means wood, housing expense, and the controlling leaders of an organization. Run, and these are just a few, run has 42 different senses. Nose runs, feet run, hose run, engine runs. Affair means occurrence, manner of concern, social event, scandalous sexual relationship. So if you do what a lot of Bible uh, students do, you go to your little dictionary there and you pick the one you like best. Ooh, that's... That'll preach right there. That's a good one. But let me show you what happens if you do that. Here's what you end up with. The leaders of the company lost body temperature with how the wood went upstream to spawn its illicit sexual relationships. All I did was take different senses of those words from the dictionary and insert them into my sentence. You can see how badly a field you can go if you use the wrong sense of a word as you're trying to discover the meaning. Context is always king when it comes to the meaning of the words. So, you want to study the key words in your text. How do you know what the key words are? Words that play a key role in the passage. You know, obviously if you're preaching Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Key word is what? Shamed. 118, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. What's the key word? Wrath. So forth. You get the idea. Words that play a key role in the passage. Secondly, words that occur frequently in that book or author. If you're doing Romans and you're doing Romans 1 to 4, you can't ignore the word righteousness because it's everywhere. Words that are major biblical words. Words like justified, propitiation, redemption. I got to tell you a story, and I don't know if this if this family's here or not, but recently uh, a family visited our church, and I spoke to them after church, and they were so thrilled with our service and all that went on. And the wife said to me, during your message, I leaned over and poked my husband and said, "Did you hear that? He he used a big word. He used the word propitiation. Obviously, they've been attending a church where they don't use big words." You know, which I think is insulting. It's like, you know what, I'm brighter than that. You can, like, talk to me like an adult. But anyway, that's my pet peeve. Um, (laughs) Words that could significantly affect the meaning of that passage as well. So that's how you identify them. And guys, look, I know I'm covering a lot. I'm trying to give you concepts here. 
So stay, stay with it. Don't lose, don't lose me in the weeds. How, how do you study the key words? Well, if you have resources, a Bible, like a software, Bible software, or if you have Hebrew or Greek resources that are keyed to your concordance where you can look them up, look them up in those resources. Do a concordance search. Um, in other words, just see where that word is used within the same book, within other books written by the same author. You know, if it's, if it's a word used in Romans, see how he uses it elsewhere in Romans. If it's Paul, see how he uses that word in the rest of Paul. Then within the same biblical chronology. In other words, don't go back, you know, a hundred years before that to find out what a word means necessarily. Why? Because words change meaning. Gay would be a great example in our culture. Go back a hundred years and it means nothing that it means today. So words change meaning. So you want to look in the same chronology. Then you look in the entirety of scripture. You're looking for those words. Now, um, what are you looking for when you do this search? Well, you're looking for various senses of the word. How is it used in different ways? What's the connotation of the word? Words have implied emotional meanings. If I say someone is incorrigible, that's not the same thing as saying he's courageous. But there are elements of similarity to those words. One's bad, one's good. Words have an emotional connotation. Stubborn and persistent. You know, my wife often looks at me and says, okay, Tom, remind me. What's the good word for stubborn? I tell her, it's persistent. That's why you married me, persistent. The usage, uh, is it literal? Is it used literally or only figuratively? For example, in English, the word green can refer to a color. That's its literal meaning, but green can also be used figuratively to describe what? You know, he's green. What does that mean? He's, he's someone who lacks experience. So you're looking, this is the kind of thing you're looking for. The synonyms, the words that are used with it in the same context. And then, of course, antonyms, the opposite. For example, the word uh, justify, when you search that word, guess what you find is its antonym in so many texts? Condemn. So you know what the word justify means. It's the opposite of condemn. It's to render a verdict of innocent, of, of righteous. So... Then based on the context of your paragraph, you decide the sense of the word the author intended. Now, I know you're not going to do that for every word in your text. That's my my job. Some of you will do that. But what I want you to see is this is what you should be looking for. So if the resources you're using aren't helping you get there, then you, you need help. You need to realize this is important. What dangers do you avoid in word studies? And here's, here's some basic mistakes. Avoid the root fallacy. This is um, like the word enthusiasm. It says it it meant possessed by the gods and therefore it means, you know, you can't do that. You can't take the word. If we do that in English, take the word nice. If you do the root, if you look at the root of the word nice, guess what the Latin word from which nice comes means? Ignorant. He's nice. Oh, that means he's ignorant. No, it doesn't mean he's ignorant. It means something different now. So don't look at the root. Dynamite is a big, big mistake a lot of people make. That's dynamite. Well, no, it's not, because dynamite hadn't been invented then. Reading all the senses of the word into that one passage. In other words, you know, making it all of them. Or choosing the one you like best, regardless of the context. Reading the meaning of the English word back into the Greek or Hebrew word, I just used the word uh, dunamis, which we get our word dynamite from it. It it is legitimate to acknowledge that the Greek word for power is so powerful that when the inventors of dynamite chose a name, they chose that word. Okay, but it doesn't mean dynamite because it wasn't there. He wasn't describing the power of dynamite. Giving a word the exact same sense every time it occurs. Law, for example. That word doesn't mean the same thing in every passage. That's a mistake. So just be aware of word studies. We're almost done with with observation. You need to survey the historical context. Basically, 
just make sure you understand the circumstances in which it was written. Use your study Bibles, your commentaries to understand the context in which it was written. Why is that important? Because if I say to you, let's roll, some of you are old enough to know what that means, some of you are not. But that is what the president of the United States said when he gave his speech after 9-11. He ended it with, let's roll. Why? There was a context, a historical context. He was borrowing the phrase from the group of passengers on that ill-fated plane in Pennsylvania when they said, we're going to storm the cockpit. And the last words you heard on the cell phone were, let's roll. So it had a historical context, and that gives meaning. You've seen me do a lot of that on Sunday night with, with Daniel. The historical context helps give a greater significance and meaning. So you want to see if there's any input from the historical context. Where do you get that? Well, you get it from out, sources outside the Bible, encyclopedias, dictionaries, history texts, trustworthy, there would be the key word, internet sites. And then you get it from the scripture itself. Often the scripture will comment on um, the historical setting. The last, the last thing you do in observation is you look in your passage and you say, What's the theological context? In other words, are there any significant theological issues in my passage? For example, uh, let me go back. For example, if you're looking at um, Romans 9, it's pretty obvious. What's the theological issue being addressed there? Election. If you look at chapter 1, and you're dealing with, with the first few verses, you're looking at the, the nature of an apostle, you're looking at the definition of the gospel, you're looking at the nature of Christ, because it talks about his being the son of God, being declared to be the son of God with power. So you're looking at your text going, what are the theological issues that my text touches on? So you identify them, then you... You take out your systematic theology, your biblical doctrine book from MacArthur or something shorter and simpler, and you look up, what does that mean? What is, what is that issue? What are the key issues with that? And then, this is key, decide how much of that theological concept needs to be explained to your audience for that passage to be clear. Don't say everything you know about election in every passage that election is mentioned. Don't say everything you know about whatever in every passage. What needs to be explained to make that passage clear? That's all you do. There it is. That's observation. Again, if you look at the first three of those, you do that before you ever start studying the book. So what you really do every week is you start from 4 through 12. The key ones that really get you going are 4 Identify the paragraphs. Five, analyze the syntax. Six, identify a preliminary theme. And then you make all those observations about the text. Those are where you're going to spend the bulk of your time. These others, you're going to do pretty quickly as you work your way through that passage. Okay? Now, we've talked about preparation. That's pretty, pretty easy. Observation is the meat of what I wanted to cover tonight. I want to touch briefly on these last three in our time remaining. Meditation. After you do your study, you need to give yourself to meditation. Why is it important? Because it's the bridge. Meditation is the bridge between knowing and doing. Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That's a reference to reading. Because in the ancient world, they read, they read out loud. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. You got reading and you got doing. What's in between? Meditation. It is the bridge between knowing and doing. What is meditation? Well, meditation, here's my definition. And again, I am really flying at 30,000 feet here. This was a full message. But biblical meditation is deliberately choosing to think deeply about something in Scripture in order, one, to better understand it, and two, to plan how to do it. It's just choosing to think deeply. I tell you what happens with me. I'll study through the morning, do all the stuff I just talked about in observation, and then I'll go for a walk, often. 
I'll go for a walk, and as I'm walking, I'm, I'm doing this very thing. What did I learn this morning? What, what is, why did Paul do that? And what, what is the meaning of that? And what am, I want to understand that. And what am I supposed to do with that? How am I supposed to respond to that passage? Am I supposed to think differently, feel differently, act differently? What is, what is this in terms of how I'm supposed to deal with it? That's, that's all meditation is. Think of it like this. It's like, it's like taking a tea bag and putting it in a hot cup of water and leaving it there. You're letting the scripture steep in your mind. That's what meditation is. That's all it is. So you study and then you guys have jobs. Every free moment when your mind isn't tied up, let your mind go back to that passage you're studying. I do that on the road. I'll be thinking about, you know, why did he, why that? Why, what was the point of that? Why did he say that? What am, I want to understand it. And then the other part is, what am I supposed to do with this? Because if I can understand what I'm supposed to do with it, then I can explain to you what you're supposed to do with it. So meditation is key. That was obviously very brief. Interpretation. Interpretation. I have to say that, I have to give this illustration briefly. A few years ago, I was teaching my daughters, and we, we usually had breakfast together, and I would teach them the scriptures in the morning. But I wanted them to understand how Christians often abuse the scripture. And so one morning, I said it just as seriously as I could, and they bought it. I said, girls, this morning, you don't need to bring your Bibles. You know, I, I, I found an article in the paper that is just so helpful, so meaningful. I want to share it with you. And so, you know, an article in the Dallas Morning News. And so I said, don't bring your Bibles. And there was an article on the front page, and I just chose one at random, honestly. I'm just, this is, I'm making this up as I go. So I chose one on the front page about an aging rock group appearing at the American Airlines Center. I, I think it was the Eagles, I'm not sure. But, but I began to read the article, and periodically I would stop and wax eloquent about the spiritual lesson that was made by, you know, the, the writer of this article. For, and once that had nothing to do with what the author, author, author meant. You know, for example, the article mentioned that they had worn dress suits for this concert. So I eagerly explained why we should dress up for worship, you know. And uh, I found other spiritual lessons in the article in the Eagles that were deeper. And uh, when I first started... When I first started, my, my daughters had these sort of, you know, kind of interested, kind of quizzical looks like, okay, well, I don't see that, but, you know, I trust you, Dad. And then after a while, they started having these very confused looks, and then, and then there were these uncomfortable looks at each other, like, Dad, I mean, what's wrong with Dad? Is he, is he on something, or, you know, what's going on? Dad's losing it. And so I waited for this to build long enough, and then I stopped, and I look at my oldest daughter, and I said, I said what? What's the problem? And She's looking kind of sheepish, and she said, well, Dad, I, I don't think that's what that article means. And that was exactly what I wanted her to say. I said, well, it's what it means to me, <laughs> but Dad, and then, of course, transition to show them, people would never do to the newspaper what they do to the Bible. You would never say that article was about what I was making it about, but so many people come to the Bible like that. We need to interpret the scripture honestly and sincerely according to its meaning. You know, the concept of private interpretation, the Catholic Church is absolutely opposed to. Here's the Council of Trent. To check unbridled spirits, it, that is, this council decrees that no one relying on his own judgment shall, in matters of faith and morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, distorting the Holy Scriptures in accordance with his own conceptions, presume to interpret them contrary to that sense which the Holy Mother Church, to whom it belongs to judge of their true sense and interpretation, has held or holds, or even contrary to the unanimous teaching of the fathers, even though such interpretations should never at any time be published. In other words, the magisterium of the Catholic Church has the right to interpret the Bible. That was the issue, one of the key issues at the core of the Protestant Reformation. You remember the testimony of Luther at the Diet of Worms in 1521. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, meaning from the scriptures, um, for I don't trust popes or councils since they've erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures. This was the point of the Reformation in large part. 
I, I'm not going to take a lot of time here, but there are arguments, biblical arguments for private interpretation. The obligations for faith and obedience are personal and judgment will be personal. It's not the church that's going to be judged. It's going to be individuals. Um, the scripture is almost always addressed to the people and not merely to the leadership. Number three, People are called upon to study the scripture personally and to teach it to their children. That requires interpretation, reading and interpretation. People are called upon and praised for evaluating what they hear taught against the teaching of the scripture. All of these are arguments in favor. And then, um, I don't have time to go to these texts, but um, the, the truth is, Charles Hodge writes, The Bible is a plain book. It is intelligible by people. They have the right and are bound to read and interpret for themselves so that their faith may rest on the testimony of Scripture and not on that of the church. Why is it so important? Because, listen to this, only the true meaning of a passage is in fact the Word of God. Let me say that again. Only the true meaning of a passage is in fact the Word of God. That's what Peter says in 2 Peter 3. He says, you know, Paul writes these things and there are those, the untaught and unstable, distort his writings as they do the rest of the scriptures, listen to this, to their own destruction. Listen, if you, if you twist and you distort and you come up with a different meaning than the original author's meaning, then you destroy yourself, you don't help yourself. This is what the cults do. When we misinterpret a text, our interpretation is not the scripture because the meaning of the scripture is the scripture. So what are we talking about with interpretation? All we mean is the proper use of generally accepted principles to determine the one divinely intended meaning of the passage. That's all we're trying to do. There are three main principles of interpretation. Get the three main principles. Here they are. When you come to decide, you've done all your study, you've done all your research, and sometimes it's pretty easy to come to an interpretive conclusion. Other times you're still wrestling with it. You're dealing, for example, with the, with the, the widow and her two mites. Oh boy, what are we going to do with that? You're wrestling with that and it doesn't seem right what's traditionally taught, and you're, you're, so it's hard to come to that interpretive decision. How do you get there? There are three main principles of interpretation, landing on what that passage means by what it says. Number one, interpret based on authorial intent. This is the biggest one. This is far and away the biggest one. The author's intended meaning is the scripture. Don't use the Bible like a Ouija board. Don't come looking for personal messages. Instead, come looking for the author's only one meaning. Jesus says in Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29, listen to this, you are mistaken not understanding the scriptures. He said, you haven't, you haven't been careful in how you interpreted the scripture. You don't understand it, the real meaning, the authorial intent. John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. You missed the meaning of the scripture. You missed what the author intended. And the same thing as in the text I quoted a moment ago in 2 Peter 3. Again, listen to that, fo- that quote from Calvin. It is the first business of an interpreter to let the author say what he does say instead of attributing to him what we think he ought to say. Discover what the biblical author intended to say. I spend on average 30 hours of my week, every week, trying to discover what the biblical author meant. That's my only goal. And if you're a teacher, that should be your goal as well. The correct meaning of scripture is the scripture. Number two interpret scripture with scripture this is also called the analogy of faith now when you see that phrase scripture interpret scripture realize it's using the word scripture in two different senses the first occurrence is the total scripture the second occurrence is any part of scripture such as the verse or passage you're studying so let me rephrase it for you here's the principle the entire scripture is the context and guide for understanding any particular passage of scripture. 
The entire scripture is the context and guide. So let the scripture interpret the rest of scripture. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this here. Okay. Number three, interpret literally. Now, don't be scared of that. Some of you come from, you know, Presbyterian or amillennial backgrounds. Don't be afraid of this word literally. All we mean is this. Follow the normal rules of interpreting any literature. You examine the language, the grammar, the words, the culture, the geography, the history. This is called the grammatical historical method. Doesn't mean, by the way, there aren't figures of speech in the Bible or allegories or symbols or word pictures. Of course there are. Those things exist in other literature as well. So as with, must, as with other literature, we must interpret the Bible, here it is, in the simplest, most literal sense, unless there is an indication in the context not to do so. This is what we mean by interpret literally. The implications of this is context always rules. And you have to pay attention to the words, the syntax, the culture, and the history. So, in other words, when you come to the scripture, interpret it like you would that article you're reading online. Or interpret it like you would that book that you're reading that's a secular book. The Bible is not a magical book. It, it's, its meaning is found in words and context and grammar. You know how to do this. You do this all the time. Come to the Bible the same way. That's what we mean by interpret it literally. Of course they're figures of speech. So you have the second coming of Christ in, Re in Revelation 19. Is that a real event? Almost all Christians would agree it's a real event. Does anybody here believe a real sword comes out of Jesus' mouth? Of course, it's a figure of speech saying that with his words, he will destroy his enemies. He'll just speak them, speak their destruction. So it's a literal event with some figurative language. So don't be afraid of interpreting literally. So there they are. Interpret based on authorial intent, interpret scripture with scripture, and interpret literally. What are some of the dangers of interpretation? Allegorizing. Adding levels of meaning to narrative. By the way, I'm, I'm borrowing these from two sources. Um, Dick Mayhew's How to Interpret the Bible for Yourself and Gordon Fee's How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Allegorizing, adding levels of meaning to the narrative. Um, spiritualizing or moralizing, giving a text a spiritual point it, the author never intended. What is the most famous example of that in the Bible? Judge not. Yeah, well, judge not, I, absolutely. But I'm thinking, about, I'm thinking about the Song of Solomon, where the Song of Solomon becomes Christ and the church, and maybe it's just me, but I don't see that anywhere. That is, a, that is an ode, a celebration of married love. So spiritualizing or moralizing. Um, proof texting. Extreme example of proof texting is Judas went out and hanged himself. Go and do likewise, and what you do, do quickly. You know, you can make the scripture say anything you want it to say. You have to interpret the passages in their context. By the way, it is appropriate to bring texts together we saw that in Romans 3, right? When Paul was proving man's depravity, just boom, 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 boom. He gave a number of Old Testament texts, strung them together to make his point. You just have to do it in keeping with their context and meaning. Using a narrative as normative. What's the most famous misappropriation of narrative as normative? Gideon's fleece, exactly. Have you ever read that passage? Do you know like God wasn't happy with Gideon? And yet these Christians go, well, I'm going to put out a fleece. It's like, <laughs> read it. Narrative isn't normative. I mean, Jeff the, either put his daughter away for life or killed her. That didn't mean you should. Nationalizing. Reading one's own country into passages that are promises distinctly given to Israel. If my people who are called by my name, well, guess what? America's not his people. I hate to tell you that. Cultural backloading, taking a view popular in our culture and attempting to read it back into a passage, like theistic evolution into Genesis 1 and 2. Good luck with that. The approval of homosexuality into Genesis 18 and 19. That one's even harder. Self-esteem into Jesus' command to love. 
reading newspaper headlines and the biblical prophecy, the role of women in marriage and in the life of the church, kind of importing our cultural ideas back into that, those passages, literalizing, taking a figure of speech and making it literal. The most famous example of that is John 6, where Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's like, I want to say to people who take that, it's like, have you ever read that passage? I mean, have you ever like studied that passage? That is Jesus doing what he does so often, saying, I'm the bread of life. I'm the water of life. I'm, that's all he's doing. Look in context. It's, it's the offer of salvation. He's saying, you got to take me and all of me. That's all he's saying. And he says, the words which I'm speaking to you are spiritual and they are life. Dogmatizing. Forcing a text meaning to fit your theological system. Boy, that happens all the time. All right. Well, I have one other part of exegesis and its evaluation. I'll just tell you what it is, and then next time I'll touch on this before we, we start the next part. It is taking commentaries. You've done all of this work, and then you take your commentaries off the shelf. You haven't, you haven't really touched them much at all yet. You're doing the study yourself. You're doing inductive Bible study. And your commentaries come off the shelf to check your work. Because if you landed somewhere none of them landed, that's a problem. Because the Holy Spirit hasn't been saying something unique to you. And if he's saying something unique to you, then it's not the Holy Spirit saying it. We'll talk about how to use commentaries briefly next time. So guys, I hope you see it is a lot of work. I want you to see it's a lot of work. But I also want you to be encouraged that it is a repeatable process that you can digest, that you can learn, that you can begin to build into your life gradually. I'm not saying you wake up tomorrow and try to do everything exactly as I shared it. I'm saying begin to think like this. Begin to read this into your Bible study because this is how you get to, in your personal Bible study or as a teacher, to the meaning of the text. That's your goal. You're a detective. Your job is to find out the authorial intent of that passage and then take that and deliver it to others. Thank you guys for coming. Let's pray together and I'll let you go. Father, thank you for this time together tonight. We've covered so much. I pray you wouldn't allow it to discourage any of these men, but Father, rather use it to encourage them, to challenge them, to up their game, to to further commit themselves to reading and to studying and to growing to see how much there is to do in this task of understanding your word. Lord, may we as teachers take your word infinitely seriously. If every word is inspired, then help us to understand and to teach every word in its context, applying it to your people. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.